Welcome to the Unitarian Christian Alliance podcast, episode 9, The Biblical Unitarian Podcast with Dustin Smith. I'm Mark Cain. This is the first of what I expect to be many interviews with other Unitarian Christian content creators. It's a way to introduce you to these curious people who dedicate many hours of their lives to transforming the information they have or know into programs that you can enjoy, share, or even get angry with, as the situation warrants. About 22 years ago, I discovered books on tape. Literally on tape. Cassettes. Plastic cartridges with two wheels wound with a long, thin film coated with a magnetically sensitive substance. An actual motor would spin the wheels and pull the thin film over a sensor and produce sound. These details are for the younger crowd and those who might be listening in like 2035. Anyway, 22 years ago, I made the switch to spoken content. I received a steady flow of books on tape from our local library, and I essentially gave up music. I am a musician, and I play music, but I barely ever listen to it. Soon came digital audio around 2005, iPods and portable recorders, and then I found podcasts. I've never looked back. Counting only my commutes to and from work, not vacation or other driving, I've listened to well over 400,000 hours of people talking on topics of my own choosing. Podcasters are especially interesting to me. I'll be talking to those who are Unitarian Christians, obviously. They are a minority, for sure, but the ranks of these podcasters are expanding. The UCA podcast is about us, the people, the Unitarian Christians. We who maneuver through life, having people shake their heads at us, sad for our souls. For many of us, it's challenge enough to just bear with a few family members or some friends or your pastor, people in our lives who may remind us regularly of our errors and of hell, or who erect barriers and rules of what we can and cannot discuss in their presence. It's a difficult road to walk. I grew up as a child knowing that Jesus had the same God that I did. My dad, Rex, was a pastor for 50 years in the organization called the Church of God General Conference, a biblical Unitarian, congregational, non-authoritarian, loose affiliation of churches. I still attend one. Dustin Smith mentions the Church of God in today's interview, and these are the folks he's talking about. Because I grew up Unitarian, I never had Trinity Sundays or illustrations about the egg, water, clovers, or whatever. I never stumbled upon topics that were verboten. When I asked difficult questions, I never had a reaction of fear or pressure to be quiet. That may sound strange to you if you think of folks like me as part of a cult, but rest assured, we actually could ask questions and challenge our leaders in our church. Yeah, strange, huh? I suspect that this non-fear-mongering upbringing helped me develop a bit more of a relaxed approach to my biblical peculiarities. After all, when I opened my mouth, I didn't incur the scorn, anger, and wrath of my own family or church leaders. Many of you have not been so fortunate. It would not take long in that environment to learn to keep your mouth shut. Silencing through intimidation and fear? Hmm. Well, we'll come back to that in later episodes. People who produce podcasts or videos on YouTube have put themselves out there on public display, very public. I think that's fascinating. I suspect you do too. So let's pull back the curtain and see how it happened. Dustin Smith is the host of the Biblical Unitarian Podcast. For more thoughts on the term Biblical Unitarian, hear the opening remarks of UCA Podcast Episode 4, or see the link in the show notes. Many Unitarian Christians would describe their theology this way, but not all of them. (laughs) And some Trinitarians think there's nothing biblical at all with any Unitarian view. I will say this in our defense. It is easier to articulate a Biblical Unitarian view using the actual words and phrases of the Bible 
than it is a Trinitarian view, for what it's worth. Dustin Smith, in his Biblical Unitarian podcast, has taken this specific aspect of theology and developed it to a remarkable degree. Whatever your view, he's got plenty for you to chew on. So today we have Dustin Smith, the host of the Biblical Unitarian Podcast. Dustin, I'm glad you're here with me. Hey, Mark. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. This is the first of what I would hope to become a long series of interviews and discussions with people who produce resources for Unitarian Christians. I felt it'd be great to start with you. Give me a little bit of your backstory. Sure. Well, I grew up, I guess you could say, in evangelical Christianity But the churches that I went to, they didn't really indoctrinate me, and for better or for worse. Uh, But I was there every Sunday and every Wednesday. At the time, my dad was a pastor. You know, I was involved in church things, going to church camps. Yeah, I I do know that I never really, I didn't really learn much. I just picked up a couple of things, and I just assumed that being a Christian means you believe in God and Jesus, and you just are a good person. Okay, and. I was challenged to read the Bible, I guess, at about age 18, and I thought to myself, well, that's a great idea. No one's ever told me I should do this. No one's ever (laughs) said I should read the Bible for myself, and started reading through some stuff in the New Testament, and I was like, wow, look at all these really cool things that I have never seen before. And so I had kind of two feelings. I had this feeling of uh, astonishment and wonder, like, wow, look at all these cool things. And then I had this other feeling of like, how come nobody told me this? How Mm. come this has been withheld from me? And the kind of person I was at that time, not with a lot of tact, was I went and confronted my youth pastor. And I said, well, hey, the Bible says this right here. How come we didn't learn this? And he said, well, that's not really what our church believes. I'm like, well, what about this right here? Well, that's not really what our church believes. And I thought to myself, you know, I can't really have a Christianity where I just choose to believe certain things and choose to not believe certain things. It's either going to be all or nothing, because mm. I felt that that perspective was a little hypocritical. Mm, okay. Uh I went to high school in Atlanta, so huh. I did whatever the equivalent of Google was in 2002 or 2003, and I found the Atlanta Bible College. <laughs> I went there, and I said, hey, I really don't know what in the world I believe right now, but if you just show it to me in the Bible, I'll believe it. Okay. I remember there was actually another college here in Atlanta, and I was applying pretty late. I was applying at the end of July, which is pretty much enrollment is closed for most places, and they kind of said, well, our enrollment is closed. And I remember applying at ABC, and they were like, yes, please, come give us your money. (laughs) Um, I had no idea what ABC believed or how unique they were at the time. Uh, They weren't trying to withhold anything. It's just that I could read over Mm -hmm. their statement of faith, and I would say, okay, that that sounds fine. Like, I, I just didn't know any better. I wasn't really indoctrinated. I was not a difficult student to bring on board with the truths that they were teaching. Uh, because I just, I wasn't really grounded in anything else. And I really am just kind of the person that I guess it just the way that I'm wired or the way that I was raised, but I'm an evidence-based person. If you could show me some evidence, that's convincing to me. If you can't show me any evidence, then I'm not going to be convinced. And so all they had to do was, uh, I think this is something the Church of God does well, is they they like to, they have all their proof texts. Like, here's 10 verses on the oneness of God. Here's 10 verses on the humanity of Jesus. Mm-hmm. And I was like, okay, that's that's very convincing to me. So, <laughs> okay. So you you made contact with ABC while you were still in high school? No, it was it was uh, after my first year of college. Okay. So I had tried another degree. I was a pre med major, and it just wasn't really something I was interested in. But okay. but I was interested in learning a little bit more about the Bible. Did you get a degree then? Uh, yes. Uh, yeah, I, I graduated in two thousand six. Learned a lot of new things there. Really kind of set me on my path. From there, I'd kind of felt like, okay, well, there's a lot of people out in the world that would really love to learn these important truths about the one God and about the human Jesus. They just are suffering because they just don't have any good teachers in front of them. And Mm. we can either all talk about and complain about how bad things are, or we can do something about it. And I thought, okay, well, let me just be one person to do something about it. So I kind of started off in the pastoral ministry track. I took my first church in South Bend, Indiana in 2007. And I was actually able at that time to also uh, go into graduate school, which I felt was a little bit more of my strength, was more of the academic side of things and not so much the pastoral side of things, but uh, both are important, I think, as a Christian. Mm -hmm. I was able to kind of have some teachers to really point me in the direction of uh, some good reading to kind of chisel off some rough edges, learn some new things. And I learned 
pretty quickly, like, okay, the academic side of things, that is really more of where I am gifted at. It takes some really special people to be really good pastors. Some people, it comes naturally to them. I had to work mm. very, very hard at it. And I'm just, I'm not, <laughs> that's not my, <laughs> my, my personal spiritual gift, I guess you could say. So, yes, that's fair. It's good to find what you, your niche and then do that, which is what you did. Right. Okay. So after you had gone through college, it was the academic side that appealed to you the most. What was your, let's say your vision for teaching and doing that kind of work? Well, I knew that if you wanted to do any sort of serious teaching outside of church ministry or parish ministry, you had to have an advanced degree. Mm. Uh, At that time, I I wasn't married and I had the freedom to kind of move wherever I wanted to and to uh, get my education wherever I wanted to. Mm -hmm. So I had that freedom and that flexibility. You completed then a master's degree? Yeah, I finished my master's degree in 2009. At the time, I had also been accepted into Bright Divinity School at TCU, and I was hoping to go there and to uh, do a little bit more graduate work Mm -hmm. to meet the qualifications to apply uh, for a doctorate. They had a particular teacher that I wanted to study with, uh, Leo Perdue, who was a world-class expert on wisdom literature. Ah. He had published a commentary on Proverbs where he talked about wisdom in the book of Proverbs as this personification. And uh, I started to see that New Testament writers were portraying Jesus in terms of wisdom. So I thought this is a good person uh, under whom I could study. And so I I went there and took every single class that I could. And mm-hmm. I was his TA and, you know, doing all the <laughs> brown nosing. I mean, I, I cut his grass and I watched his home while he was like all, all the stuff that uh, anyone who's in graduate school, they know that's the kind of stuff that you do. Okay. And it was really good because I was able to learn some things that former teachers just didn't know. I was able to continue to be uh, expanded in my understanding, and I was able to be pointed in in the direction of uh, resources. Mm -hmm. Although I I went there with some interest in learning a little bit more about wisdom, I actually became interested in the book of Revelation and trying to really kind of grasp the narrative of that and its, its function and the sort of ethics that it was trying to get its readers to to understand and to adapt. Had you been thinking about a podcast during your college time? Well, you know, I was in college between 2002 and 2006, and podcasts didn't exist ah. at that time. I don't even think we were watching YouTube very much, but I like to sit in front of the camera and do some video teachings, and mm-hmm. we would watch a lot of teachings from a variety of, of teachers. But uh, podcasts became a lot more popular, I think, in the last five years. And of course, YouTube has kind of blown up and there's so much content that you can put on there. Most every major church takes a sermon that's on video and they put it on YouTube because it's right. it's free hosting. It's great. Yeah. I do remember it was about 2017 and I was thinking, I really want to produce something because you could go into iTunes and look in their podcast and you can search Biblical Unitarian and you would get zero results. Uh, but yet you could type in the Trinity or evangelicalism and you would get a hundred results. And I'm thinking, this is where people are going to get their entertainment. People have long rides to work. They go and they run in their workouts or mm-hmm. they just like to listen to podcasts, doing a variety of things, you know, cleaning around the house. Yeah. And yet we have nothing for them in regard to biblical Unitarian theology. And I was like, well, at least I'm going to do that. What am I going to call it? Let's just call it the (laughs) biblical Unitarian podcast. Why not? Yeah. So you get points for creativity on that. Yeah. (laughs) You get points for clarity. (laughs) I've noticed that in your content, you do cover a breadth of material, but it does constantly circle around that topic. How did you choose biblical Unitarian as a focus rather than a really broad topic? Like, you know, Sean Finnegan is another podcast where he'll go in all sorts of directions. I kind of felt like I wanted to provide something that no one else was doing because at the time, uh, Dale Tuggy was doing his Trinity's podcast, but even his scope is is wider than what I'm particularly doing. Mm-hmm. And Sean, of course, has his podcast and him and I, we went to school together, so we know each other pretty well. And his is, mm-hmm. is very wide. Yeah. He has a lot of different people that he interviews I just kind of wanted to just focus on one thing that I didn't feel was there for interested biblical Unitarians or even just truth seekers to go and to have and listen to. And when I started it off, I thought, okay, it's actually not going to be that difficult to uh, make a bunch of content. But (laughs) I tell you, having done this, I just released episode 151 this week, and it's been every week. I haven't taken any weeks off. 
at all. Oh my goodness. So <clears throat> it's, there's a lot of work to be done, but actually I have grown and learned a lot in this process for a couple of reasons. One, when you're constantly having to put out new content, you're constantly reading and thinking about things. Uh, you're thinking about what is the best way to communicate this to people within a podcast medium. I can't use visuals. I can't mm -hmm. use a video. I can't use Bible works to put up Greek words for people. Right. And so it's been a learning process with that. Uh, also, I think writing out a script helps you to organize your thoughts in a way that really makes sure that you have a good understanding of what you're trying to communicate. So it's interesting that even though I've only been doing this for three years, I felt like I've grown a significant amount in my understanding of the Christology that is exhibited uh, within the New Testament, mm -hmm. at least my understanding of it. I will freely admit that when I first started listening to your podcast years ago, I thought, well, what happens when he's explained all the content? And here you are, you're still going. You're taking just chunks of revelation now, and you've taken chunks of different sections. I see your podcast as a process of thinking through materials in a very deliberate way. Um, so if somebody was thinking, oh, why would I want to listen to that podcast? I would say with the, the list of podcast episodes you have, you could scroll through the list and find a section of the Bible that maybe you are currently studying, and you've got it. It's amazing that, that you are able to take the one topic and develop it as you have. How would you describe your podcast to somebody who, who was interested in uh, getting some more resources? What would your description be? That's a good question. Um, <laughs> I, I have this, I guess you call it a catchphrase or a, a slogan, I guess that's the right word for it. Mm -hmm. Starting conversations about the oneness and unity of God and about the humanity of Jesus. And I try very deliberately to not make this a, a conversion tool or something where it's it's clear that I have some sort of motive or agenda or an ax to grind. Mm -hmm. I'm very comfortable in the podcast saying, well, this probably means this, or it's very likely that this means this. And I think the more and more that I kind of study the Bible and the more that I learn just the amount of information that's out there, I'm a little more cautious about making super definitive statements. I'm able to kind of look at probabilities and say, well, it's likely that this writer meant to convey these particular terms, or it's very probable, or it's almost certain that this meaning uh, would not have been uh, discerned by the original readers, that sort of thing. So when I make conclusions, I really just summarize the findings, and I don't mm -hmm. try to go for the hard sell. And I've actually found that that is a little bit more appealing to readers because I'm not trying to slam anything down their throats and they're free to disagree. But I'm really trying to lay out the evidence as impartially as I can, even to admit that, hey, something might look like it's difficult for my own position. Yeah. Transparency, honesty, sincerity is something that people are a lot more sensitive to nowadays, given the world of social media, where you find out people are lying right and left to you about their lives. It doesn't surprise me at all that, that your listeners are appreciative of that, because it's part of the process for themselves to grow and to take it in and then consider for themselves. The thing that got me originally interested in talking on radio was which what I originally thought I would do was the program The Bible Answer Man. At the time it was Hank Hanegraaff and you yep. you might be too young. Oh, I know he is. <laughs> in that program, you were calling him to find out essentially what the right way to think is. And uh that was pretty off-putting to me. So, congratulations. I think you did the right thing by going the evidential approach and being open about areas that are challenging or difficult or what it probably means. Was starting a podcast uh, more challenging than you thought, less challenging? I mean, the actual technical stuff, if there's somebody else thinking of, hey, I should do a podcast. You know, you started it several years ago when there were less resources. You know, it is a lot of work to do well. Mm -hmm. You have to have uh, the right equipment it has to be put together uh, correctly. You have to have very good sound. If you have terrible sound, you might as well just give up because that's a big deal for people. If they don't like the sound or if it's patchy or if it's not edited very well, then people aren't going to listen to it. And people are are pretty critical because there's yeah. a new podcast popping up every single day, it seems. There's mm -hmm. a lot of voices out there that are trying to get your attention and trying to have your time. Mm -hmm. I also found that if I wanted to be organized, I have to sit down and I have to write a script. And for me, I have to think ahead, like, okay, where do I want this to go? 
what sort of things do I need to say? When I look at passages of scripture, I think, okay, how much content is enough to fill a podcast? How much is too much? How much is not enough? So a lot of planning, uh, a lot of typing. I tell you, my my I have Grammarly, and so it is constantly looking at all the writing I'm doing. It says, oh, you've written more than 98% of the people in the world because of like all the typing that I'm doing <laughs> every single week. It's pretty crazy. So it, it, is a, it is a lot of work for people, I would say that. So if you're going to get into it, just realize that it's a time commitment. It's a lot of work. It's a lot of thinking. The recent uh, surveys say that less than 1% of your viewership or the people that listen to you will even interact with you like personally. Mm. So don't expect to do it to become famous or you're definitely not going to make a lot of money doing it or anything like that. You'll probably spend more money producing it, but I'm just doing this to try to fill a, a void in the podcasting world that I thought could use some, some truth. Yeah. At least as far as I think it is, I, you know, I could be wrong on some things, but that's all right. Yeah, that's all right. Do you have an example of somebody who interacted with you, maybe a particular episode that that meant a lot to them? And You know, occasionally I get some people that will say, hey, this particular episode really helped clarify something that I've been wrestling with for like 15, 20 years. And that means a lot hearing that. Uh, it's nice mm -hmm. to know that, hey, people are actually listening to what I'm doing and that's making a difference. I'll have some people that will ask for some clarification, which is good because it tells me that while I think that I'm communicating clearly and effectively, I'm not. And mm. so I need to be a little bit more careful about the words that I use. I've had people tell me to slow down my pace. And so I'm really careful now to read a lot slower and to have some pregnant pauses. So, you know, the feedback has been good. Yeah. It, given the amount of time now that I've started a podcast, I completely appreciate the effort that goes into it. And just a kind word, a thank you. It just goes a long way. Is there a show or a series of shows that you did that you really enjoy, like the, your favorite section that you've done so far from Scripture? Yeah, I think the series that has been most meaningful to me was where I really tried to establish the biblical foundations of wisdom Christology and to show how the New Testament writers were portraying Jesus uh, as the embodiment of God's wisdom that was meaningful for me because that was not really something that I had learned in my early biblical Unitarian training. Mm. And yet it's actually something that you pull off a commentary off the shelf on like Hebrews 1 or Colossians 1 or John 1. Uh, and they'll all talk about wisdom Christology as if the reader already understands this. Mm. And yet people don't understand it. In fact, if you go to Amazon, you were to type in a book on wisdom Christology, there aren't even any books on it. It's a, something that all the scholars know and understand, but it hasn't quite yet been passed on in a way that is understandable to the, the common everyday pew sitters. Mm -hmm. And I just really kind of been working on it as a side project. And I feel like I've got a good grasp of it now. And I've even tried... Uh, teaching it to uh, some people in, in church, just trying to really see how this is. And it's it's a complicated subject. It's it's complicated because you're starting from uh, Proverbs and Job and Psalms where you're taking a personification of God, which is his wisdom. And it basically means it's it's God's wise engagement with his creation. It's also the embodiment of God's wise commands. God wisely interacts uh, with his people, and that gets personified as this female figure, wisdom. Mm -hmm. Now, in the early Aryan controversies, they just assumed that this female figure, wisdom, was just the pre-incarnate Jesus, but it was an actual conscious person alongside God, and there you have right. the pre-existence of Jesus. But you're not going to find any commentaries today that say that. Huh. Like, nobody, no serious scholar makes that point. They all know that wisdom in the book of Proverbs is a personification. There's a big difference between a personification and and a person. Right. So right. I've also been able to trace and to see that, okay, this is all started in the book of Proverbs. And even by the end of the book of Proverbs in chapter 31, you have the ideal woman or the strong wife. It gets translated in a variety of ways. As a former exercise, I'd gone through and I translated the book of Proverbs. And I just noticed that in Proverbs 31, all of these rare words and phrases that are being used to describe this woman were formerly used in Proverbs 1 through 9 to describe Lady Wisdom. I'm like, okay, not only do we have God's wisdom personified, 
in Proverbs. We also have God's wisdom embodied into a human being in Proverbs. That's actually the earliest evidence of incarnation, 400 years before the Gospel of John, before Jesus was even born, and it's the embodiment of a personification into a person, not the embodiment of a conscious person into a person. Yeah, And I was able to trace that through some other uh, Jew- pieces of Jewish literature to demonstrate that by the time we got to the New Testament, we have a variety of persons that were describing human beings as the embodiment of God's wisdom. And then I see the New Testament writers doing it of Jesus. And I think, mm-hmm. okay, they're not doing anything brand new. They're just continuing this Jewish way of portraying famous people as the climax or the epitome of God's wise engagement. So it's complicated in that sense. I get it. And it requires a lot of episodes, but I have felt that by going through and making those episodes, it's helped me to organize my own thinking. It's helped me to better understand what's going on in the New Testament. Mm -hmm. It's helped me to better convey that to other people. And let's be fair, like when you understand some things in scripture, it helps you to sleep better at night as well. (laughs) So. Yeah, that's that's great. I do remember that episode about the the woman at the end of Proverbs, and that was really cool. It didn't, hadn't even crossed my mind to think like that, but there it was. It, it was just truly amazing. I did have a question about. <laughs> I don't know if you want to answer, but was there a show that was particularly difficult, or maybe even one that you regret, or wish you could go back and be like, oh, I want to change that. You know, I, I go back and sometimes I'll listen to uh, some of my episodes because. When I first started out, I actually had a script, but I wasn't publishing my script with my episodes. And I had one of my former students say, why don't you include your script with your episodes? And I thought, well, that's a great idea. I'll just go and start doing that. I wish I had Mm. started that from the beginning. So I'm glad I had that particular feedback. Mm. If I could go back and talk to myself three years ago, I would say, slow (laughs) down, less is more, and realize that people don't have a long attention span. You know, I try to keep my episodes around like 30 minutes. Mm-hmm. I've had some people tell me that they appreciate that rather than having an hour, an hour and a half long episodes. It's easy for people to consume and keep up with the content. Yeah. I think that's just kind of part of, of teaching is that you try to be a little bit more effective the next time that you do it. And that feedback is good. So yeah. if anyone has any feedback, I'm happy to listen to that because I'm willing to better myself and my, my approach. Mm. You've done all this work on that particular topic, and now you have a lot of written content because you've been writing out your manuscripts. Have you considered publishing Wisdom Christology as a book? You know, I have. Uh, I, I, I don't. I don't talk about it too too publicly because writing a book is a is a lot of work. Um, yeah. In 2015, I was able to get together with a couple of other people. We were able to do one of these these three views books. And this is a oh, three yes. views of the identity of Jesus called the Son of God. And I was able to uh, contribute uh, what I call the Socinian view. That's probably not the best terminology now that I think about it, but it's it's the biblical Unitarian view of mm-hmm. a human Jesus that's empowered by God, but he didn't have a, a conscious preexistence. Mm-hmm. So I'd already done that. that. That had been out there for a couple of years. And then I thought, okay, well, let's just kind of do some, some podcast on this. But Writing a book is a lot of work if you want it to be taken seriously, if you want it to actually get accepted by a publisher, because anybody can publish out of their own garage or they can publish, you know, free publishing or through, Mm. you know, not through a publisher, but you're not going to be taken seriously in academic circles. You're not going to have your books in theological libraries. No serious scholar is going to review that. So if I want this stuff to be taken seriously in that world, um, and that's kind of in the world where I work currently, it's got to be done Mm. right. And if I'm going to do that, okay. I need the time to do that. And right now, I'm constantly doing all this, and I got my other work. I just I don't have the time to invest in that. But it's it's something I want to do. It's something that's kind of it's it's on the back burner. It's brewing. So please, nobody else go and and take <laughs> take that topic and and ride on it there. So all right. So right now you're working through Revelation. Why don't you describe your current series? Should somebody jump over to your podcast right now and dive in where you are? What would they be hearing? I think they would be hearing a kind of walkthrough in the book of Revelation to see how Revelation portrays uh, God and the risen Jesus. And that's really important that the Jesus that we see outside of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John is the risen and exalted and authorized Jesus. Mm -hmm. So at the beginning of the gospel of Matthew, Jesus has authority on earth to forgive sins. But by the end of the book of Matthew, he has authority in heaven and on earth. So it's a 
promotion, you uh, could say. Even Paul says yeah, yeah. that uh, God highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name. So there's something at the resurrection of Jesus that gives him that. And so the highest Christological things that are said of Jesus are always after his resurrection. Having done my doctoral dissertation on Revelation and actually recently got done uh, co-teaching uh, a course on Revelation to some graduate students and advanced degree students, I feel very comfortable with the book. And I think for a lot of people, Revelation is one of two extremes. It's either something that they're afraid of because they think it's just doom and gloom and the end of the world. <laughs> and so they just, they don't want to touch it. Or they yeah. make all of their theology on it in reading these, what I like to call, it's like newspaper theology. They they read the newspaper and they read events back into the Bible, which is wrong. You shouldn't do that. Or they mm. use the book of Revelation to mark their calendar of when Jesus is going to come back. Those are just two extremes that modern scholarship has just basically abandoned. And they're saying, look, this was a uh, prophetic book. It's a poetic book. It was a visionary book that was written to actual communities in Asia Minor. And they kept this book and they cherished this book and they copied it and they spread it, which means that they understood it. They found value in it. And I feel comfortable enough with it walking people through and, and showing them, okay, how is the narrative portraying God? How is the narrative portraying Jesus? What sort of portrayal would this have given to those early Christians in Asia Minor at the end of the first century that were being tempted to participate in imperial worship or to worship uh, Zeus or Aphrodite or all these other local gods? But particularly, it's it's the imperial worship thing that is the the major competitor for the exclusive worship of God and Jesus for the early Christians. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I like the uh, approach of taking Revelation and looking at it from a Christological perspective, because it would be arguably one of the most mature and well-considered books that would inc include Christology. I mean, this was well past the time they spent having debates and discussions about stuff back in Jerusalem in the book of Acts. You know, you go to Acts, you're going to find out what were they talking about, boom, right off the bat. You go to Revelation and you find out, well, now what are they saying many years later as John is elderly and writing this stuff down? And they're not saying remarkably different things. They haven't discovered uh, a triune God at this point. They're still explaining the Jesus that was there in the book of Acts. It's really cool. Right. It's interesting to see because we know from church history that something that all church historians acknowledge is that Christology developed over the next few hundred years. And so I can mm -hmm. sit there and I can look at, okay, where do we have the book of Revelation on this? Where is the Christology as that stands? I don't assume that by definition, it's going to be exactly what we see in the book of Acts or in First Corinthians or anything like that. I just, I want the text to speak for itself. I want to see where it mm. is. And what I have found is that we're not really getting anything brand new in the book of Revelation. It's just telling us things that we've already learned. It's just giving it to us in much more of a poetic, metaphoric perspective. To say that Jesus is a lamb is better than saying Jesus died for your sins because the lamb has a lot more uh, invested meaning into it. They both mean the same thing um, at its base level, but you know, it is, I mean, I could say go, or I could say, look, it's a green light. You know, symbols <laughs> sometimes are much more powerful yeah. than words. Well, I'm enjoying the series. Let's talk for a moment about podcasts in general. And I, I want to do this because the UCA podcast is for helping people find resources. That's one of my goals. And there's a possibility that some of the people who found the UCA podcast did it because you could hear the grandson at the end of one of the episodes saying something. And so they went through the trouble, they got a podcast app on their phone, and they're like, well, now what do I do? You know, What are these things called podcasts? How do you enjoy podcasts most often? Oh, man, I use them for a lot of things. I'll tell you what, some podcasts have some really deep lectures, mm -hmm. and this is going to sound counterintuitive, but uh, listening to things that really help me to think actually helps me to fall asleep. So a lot of people, they, they read a book when they want to fall asleep. Well, I try to listen to something that really makes me think, and it really kind of tires my mind down and helps me to fall asleep. Oh, interesting. Uh, I, you know, so if people need help falling asleep, they can listen to my podcast, <laughs> but uh, for real. Um, you know, some people have, they have long commutes to work, or they like to go, you know, they go walk their dog, or they go working out or they're cleaning the house at home, whatever you're doing, mm -hmm. there's just a lot of content to consume. Yeah. I've told some people, they're like, what are podcasts again? I said, think of anything that you're very interested in. There's a podcast on it where they'll talk about it until your ears are burning. Yeah. And people are like, oh, that's interesting. I'm like, no, it's like build your own custom talk show 
of everything you're interested in. So I use the podcast app Overcast. There's many of them. I use it on an iPhone. But one of my favorite things is I build a playlist and I, I named it Q. And I look through the list of all the new podcasts that have come in, all the episodes. And I'm like, oh, that's interesting. Stick it in the queue. That's interesting. Stick it in the queue. And I just build this massive queue. And then I listen to it in all of my commutes or when I'm mowing the lawn or, you know, washing the dishes. And it gets longer and longer. I can't keep up with it. But then thankfully, every now and then I have vacation time where I'm sitting in the car for hours. And that's where that cue comes in real handy because it'll just go from one to the other. And I can even turn up the speed of some of them because some people talk really slowly and I can make it go, you know, five times as fast and I can get right through all the content. It's great. So the ways in which people can consume podcasts are, are pretty amazing. The fact that we, they exist in the first place and are so accessible, then you can arrange them, group them select them ad hoc based on how you're feeling and then just say go and then you're off to the races doing your dishes cleaning your gutters and you can be enjoying material that is personally interesting to you it's really amazing what tool do you use if i may ask to listen to your podcast well i am a iphone user so there is let's see what it's called i think it's just called the podcast app Oh, okay. The one that comes. Yeah. The one that comes with it. It's just, it's very yeah. basic. It's very easy to use. Mm -hmm. There's a good chance that if you're looking for a particular podcast, searching on the iTunes podcast search bar is going to mm -hmm. find you what you're looking for. That's, I think the most popular one in the world at this point. Yeah. And if somebody hasn't done something like that, like suppose there's a listener who just goes to the webpage and clicks play right on the web page and is thinking, oh, wait, there's a tool I could use for this. Uh, many people now have used things like Netflix and Disney Plus and stuff where you go to the app and you see all the things that are available and you have a little plus like, put this on my list. The podcast apps function just like that. You search for something you're like, oh, I want to hear this. And there's the subscribe button. You hit it and that's officially on your list. And now all the new episodes as they arrive just pop up like magic. For many people listen to podcasts, we're just saying what they already know, yeah. but appreciate that there are folks who just really haven't done this. And well, of course, I'm a big fan of it. <laughs> so I want them to enjoy it as much as I do. <laughs> just as a personal note, you recently had a child. Did you not? I think so. <laughs> I've lost a lot of sleep lately, yeah. so it's hard to remember what's going on. <laughs> That's your first child? It is my first child, yeah. Okay. Well, congratulations on that. Um, I'm impressed that it hasn't yet disrupted your consistent cycle of podcasts. You know, if if he cries or, or whines in the middle of recording, I don't even apologize because I'm not going to apologize for having a child. I'm not going to apologize for having a, a messy house right now. Like, it is what it is, and I yeah. think people understand, and, you know, it, <laughs> that's life. That's it, so. Yeah. Yeah, I love it. I like things real. I like to, you know, enjoy the moment, the the personal connection. Thank you very much for coming on now and sharing a little bit about yourself so that uh, the UCA audience has a clear sense of, ah, that's who Dustin is. Um, so if you are listening and you want to enjoy this podcast, you'll find it on any podcast player. You just search for Biblical Unitarian and it's going to be right to the top because there aren't podcasts called Biblical Unitarian except for yours, Dustin. <laughs> You've got the only one. Right. If somebody wanted to connect with you, what would be the best way for them to do that? Well, you'll see me posting on the UCA Facebook group, so you can connect with me on Facebook if you want to do that. Mm -hmm. uh, I can provide my email for the show notes. I have a group on Facebook, which really just kind of announces the fact that, hey, here's a preview of what I'm going to do this week. I give a preview on Monday, and it gets released on Thursday. Okay. And if people want to interact with the episode, they can do that. If people just search on Facebook for Biblical Unitarian Podcast, uh, they'll find it. All right, excellent. Well, I'll put your email address in the show notes. Dustin, thank you so much for taking this time with me today. I truly appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for having me. A few notes. Dustin's series on Wisdom Christology started in episode 19 and went to number 26. In podcast players, you know, the apps, you can show all the past episodes and scroll through them. You can search, too, which is helpful when there are hundreds of episodes. Also, Dustin described the large amount of work involved in making a podcast. If you're considering starting one, I don't want that to immediately dissuade you. There are several styles of podcasts, and some are easier to make than others. 
if your podcast is intended to be, say, a casual conversation between a few people, for example, then you'll not have as much editing work as one like this, where I am very deliberate in what goes in, and I spend time with many details, including extra audio enhancements and strange voices. If you are seriously considering it and want to bounce ideas around, email me, podcast at unitarianchristianalliance.org. I will be glad to help you out as much as I am able. If you have feedback about the show, use the same email. And one more thing, hot off the digital presses. Dustin has just started the Biblical Unitarian Podcast YouTube channel, where he'll feature some of the same content, but in shorter, shareable format. They'll be under 10 minutes each. A link to the YouTube channel is in the show notes. You know how you listen to someone for a while, and you have a mental picture of what they look like? Well, now's your chance to find out Dustin looks a little bit more like James Dean than you might have thought. Hello, my name is Daniel. I'm from Germany. A few years back, my parents started to study the topic of the Trinity, or rather the question, who is God and who is Jesus? Which also led for me to dive into this topic, and after various stages of understanding, it's now exactly one year since I'm calling myself a Unitarian Christian. Thank you for building this alliance. Thank you for the podcast. I really enjoy it, especially your humor. I wish all the best for you and everyone who's listening. Thanks for the kind words, Daniel. Unitarian Christians have a rich history in Europe. There were many Unitarians in the Anabaptist groups. There were the Polish Brethren, and many influential individuals, too. I'm glad you're with us, and I pray that in your area of Germany, you find many others, and they find you. God bless you, and thank you. If you haven't heard your own voice on this podcast yet, you're missing out. Just imagine the thrill of sharing an episode with a friend and saying, At the end, after the Star Wars scene, you'll hear me. Instant fame and riches beyond your wildest... Okay, well, maybe not. Still, this whole UCA thing exists because of you. May as well join in, right? Dustin, thank you for risking your reputation on this somewhat sketchy new UCA podcast. And thank you even more for expending hours of your life creating thoughtful and insightful podcasts. It was an honor to spend this time with you. May God bless you in your truth pursuits. I hope this podcast serves you well.